Our guest today is Barry Buzz. Barry's written a book called Life Purpose, dealing with, uh, well, it's where you, uh, why are you here, where are you going? And on the program today, Barry, what are some of the primary nuggets we're gonna get to? Okay, we're gonna talk about the, the big purpose of God. Okay. God has a purpose for all of mankind. And, and then secondly, we're gonna talk about some of our individual problem areas, the dysfunctions of our family. How do you deal with that? If we don't deal with that, we can't get into the right. purpose we're called for. Well, that's fantastic. Barry, I'm looking forward to it because we're gonna find, you know, along the way here in three programs, and we'll be back with us again on the next program, we're gonna find God's purpose in our lives individually. Thank you for joining us in it today. I just love the book that we're offering today. Our author is Barry Buzza, but the book is called Life Purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody's looking for their life purpose. You know, okay, go ahead. Why are you here and where are you going? Yeah. <laughs> That's basically That's what it. he's going to be helping with us, you know, yesterday and today. That's an intriguing topic. I think there's a lot of people that are going to hear those two questions and say, hey, I've thought that before. I've wondered before. Well, this is going to be a good show. Mm -hmm. Well, Barry's kind of a neat guy. Mm -hmm. I really, I really like him. Uh, this is the second time he's been with us. Uh -huh. First time around, you know, you don't know who, what to expect. Now the second time he's been here, I say, I'm so glad he came back. I'm oh, so glad. Good. Well, really, I'm serious. That, that way about very so. You're going to enjoy him. If you haven't not known him before, you're going to enjoy him today. We're talking about life purpose with Barry Buzza. Uh, Barry, uh, on the program, to, uh, you know, let's just give people a little bit of a review of what we did on the last program. Okay. We are, we are talking that God has designed a purpose for everyone before we're even born. Matter of fact, before we're even conceived, Willard, God has written my entire life journal out. And I, I have a choice to either fit into the plan that God has for my life or to reject it and, and go off that path. Mm -hmm. uh, David calls it the path of life or the path of righteousness or John calls it the light, walking in the light. And so God has this design for me and I can choose every day and along with my life whether to stay in that path or not. So we also can know that purpose. And one day we will be judged for did we keep the purpose or not? Did we wander away from it? And so this book is to help people determine what is my personal purpose in life so that when I get to the end of the journey, I can say, I did it. I did what I was supposed to do. Right. Yeah, we talked, I remember we talked briefly about you. You actually do a course on this, uh, or you talk about purposes with, with children. Yeah. And actually taking them to visit a cemetery. Yeah. To help, you know, and and you, you say a lot of them have never been to a cemetery before. No. This is their, their kind of their initiation. Hey, look, someday there's going to be a plot yeah. out here and there's going to be a stone out there and it's going to say something about you. And it's hard for them to get it. Unless they've lost a grandma or grandpa or something like that, it's hard for them to really get that. We get it as we get older. We begin to see more and more funerals and you get it. I'm going to die one day. And so the question is, where do I want to be at the end of my journey? What do I want people to say about me at my mm -hmm. funeral? Not just the niceties, but really Barry was a good dad or Barry was a good papa or whatever it was. What do I want people to say about yeah. me? So we start there, kind of where, where do I want to end up? You mentioned yesterday, too, about uh, knowing where you are, knowing where you're kind of going to want to end up. Yeah. About that you and your life plan in kind of like seven-year cycles. Yeah. That was new to me. That there, there is a natural physiological change in our bodies every seven years. It, as I understand it, all the cells in my body, except maybe the exception of my heart, the cells are actually different seven years from now. So my body is changing all the time. New cells and old cells are dying. New cells are coming. So every seven years is a complete change in the cells of my body. In, in addition to that, I have these seven years, kind of preschool years. Then I have my elementary school years from seven to 14. And then I move into my teens to 21. And then I become a young man, and then I become a middle-aged man, now family and those kinds of things, and then I become midlife, and, and on and on. So I find those seven years fits very neatly into my plans. And, and again, we, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds. God is sovereign, but I still have the right and responsibility mm -hmm. to have some kind of direction. So if I have a plan, so I have a destination, and then I have a plan, that kind of helps me right. live out my life. Where are we going today? We're going to go into a little bit more practical. And, and how do I discover what my, my well, I'm going to talk about birthright. 
what do I talk about my, my personal birthright? How do I discover it? And some just the, the means of doing that. Okay. So hopefully we can figure well, that out. Well, that's, okay. I, I, that sounds interesting to me because yeah. so birth there is a birthright. Yeah, I, I use the word. It, it's a it's a biblical word, and uh, because I use Jacob as, as my example in the Bible, my biblical example, I follow his life through, and I, I see this birth of Jacob and Esau, and God had an intention because see God had already written their lives. So when mom, Rebecca, was pregnant with them, there was this fighting in her womb. And she said, what's going on? If this is so good, why is it so bad? They're, they're fighting inside my womb. I can't even imagine what that would be like. I mean, to have a conflict going on at that point. Now, that's, yeah, that's before true. they're even born. Because it actually says that, doesn't it? That it does there's say. A, a war going on yeah. in the womb. She was so excited about being pregnant because she had waited 20 years to be pregnant. and But now there's this fighting inside my womb. And God says, well, that's... Because God had already written the journal of both Jacob and Esau. He, he knew their natures. And so he said, that's because there will be an ongoing battle between not just two people, but two nations. Two nations are in your womb. So God didn't just see wow. Jacob and Esau. He saw wow. the nation that's of crazy. Israel and the nation of the Edomites. So he, the, not just this generation he had planned out. He had generations ahead. So he, he saw the, the very end of the Edomites that they would ultimately be destroyed. Herod was the last Edomite, and Obadiah tells how he, Edomites will be destroyed. He saw all that, and that's why he disqualified Esau from the birthright. Esau was the firstborn, but he disqualified him because he knew exactly how that pathway would go. Because it would die out. Because it would it die out. It would not have the, it, it didn't have the, the life generating capability in it to exactly. go on and, and produce. It didn't. And then also the attitude of Esau was this uh, disregard for his birthright. He didn't understand it. He, he, he despised his birthright, God said. And so that's why his name, he, he was named, when, when he was born, Isaac and, and Rebecca were having these kids. I can just imagine Isaac in there. Isaac's name means laughter. He probably had a good sense of humor. And so uh, Esau comes out and he's covered in hair. And so Isaac laughs and he said, let's, let's call him Harry, which is what Esau means. Harry, let's call him Harry. <laughs> and Rebecca, she's, she's out of it. She doesn't have any say. So he's, he's Harry. He's Esau. Yeah. And then Jacob comes out holding his brother's heel. Well, let's call him heel grabber. That's what the name Jacob means, heel grabber. Let's call him heel grabber. Because he comes out of the womb. Yeah, grab, grab the heel. Brother. But that was prophetic. I talked about that yesterday, about the pro prophetic nature of our names, yeah. that he really is one who's always trying to get ahead. And so... This birthright that God had, the birthright ultimately for their family, would be, he, he would be the predecessor of Jesus himself. And he would be the father of the, the nation of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And uh, so I talk about the journey that he goes through to get to that birthright. Now, ultimately, Israel did fail. They really did fail. Jesus was walking in in the, um, the last day. It was the last week of his life, and he's walking by the fig tree. Remember that? And the fig tree is a picture of Israel and the uh, success and um, blessing of God. But it had leaves, but no fruit. And fig trees are unique in that they have fruit and leaves at the same time. Like a cherry tree produces leaves and then blossoms and then fruit. But fig trees produce figs and leaves at the same time. It's, it, yeah, they're unique in that way. And even though it wasn't the season for figs, they, they were but if beginning. There were leaves, if there were leaves, there should have been figs there then. That's right. And so God, Jesus cursed it as an example, as a teaching that you guys have the show, but you don't have the fruit. And that's exactly a picture of us. We can have all the show. I can be going to church every Sunday, singing the songs, lifting my hands, whatever. I've got the show, but there's no fruit. And the fruit is my deeds. In front of this book, I have these, these pictures of uh, pear trees. And the reason I did that, I have it on my business card too, is because fruitfulness is why I live. So if I'm a pear tree, my purpose is to produce pears. If I'm an apple tree, my purpose is to produce apples. So I have a distinct purpose that I've been created for. I don't expect that pear tree to produce apples. Uh, but the pear tree has to know this is why I exist. If it doesn't produce pears or figs, cut it down. It's useless. It's just show. And so that's kind of like our lives. And I have a distinct purpose that God has designed for me. If I don't do it, then cut it down. It, it, it serves no purpose. It, it's frightening, but it, it drives me to finding what is my purpose and then fulfilling that yeah. purpose. Now, now the, so the challenge, if, if, if I'm listening to, if I'm hearing you, you, so correct me if I'm way off base, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be gentle. Yeah, yeah I know, okay. But, but with, with, when, when Jesus says what he does about that fig tree. Yeah. He's saying that, that Israel, you've had a purpose. You've had a calling. Yeah. You've really missed the calling. Yeah. 
And the calling goes back to their dad. Their, their dad is Abraham, of course. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and God spoke very clearly to Abraham. and says, Abraham, your job, bottom line, Genesis 12, 3, bottom line, is that in you, in your family, all the nations, all the ethnic groups of the world will be blessed. And that word blessed means to come into your destiny, come into your purpose. That's what it means. So, so, so because of you, every nation, ethn, ethnic group That's right. on earth will come into its purpose. Yeah. And they're listed in, in Genesis 10, those, those 70 nations. Now there are 24,000 ethnic groups in the world. And so that purpose was passed on to the Gentiles. Now, Christian Jews, of course, to Messianic Jews and Gentiles are in Abraham's family. That's what Paul says in Galatians. You are now Abraham's offspring. So, so okay, our responsibility then, or our calling, yes. is to see fruitfulness come to every nation as far as their fulfillment goes. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. That's the grand purpose of God. That's not my individual purpose. No, no, that's, that's, the, the, but that's the big purpose, purpose of God. So when we're talking about purpose, we're talking about the grand purpose of God, which is Genesis 12, 3, that all the families, all the ethnic groups of the world will be brought into their destiny. And that's our purpose as a church. Now we pick it up where Abraham passed it on to the Gentiles with, with the Messianic Jews. We pick up this purpose and our, our big purpose is to bring all the ethnic groups into the kingdom of God. Okay, now if, if Israel failed and were show and no fruit, mm -hmm. is the danger there that we become show yeah. and no fruit? Yeah, the well, same thing's happening to us. Here, here's a verse in Luke, Luke 7. Jesus was talking to the, the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of, of the Jews, Pharisees and Sadducees. And he says, the, the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves. They lost it. They didn't get it. Now, that doesn't mean that all Jews are that way. No, but, no, no. but these no, religious they, leaders they, had all the outward show. They had the robes. They had the tassels. They had the prayers. They sang the songs. But they rejected God's purpose for themselves. And that's the danger in us that we would do the same thing. What, what's God called us to? Not just to go to church and sing songs and no, no, preach right. sermons, but we've got a purpose. So that's the, the big purpose wow. of God, Willard. Wow, okay. And then we have individual purposes in that. So I have, um, well, you can take anything, a, a blender. A blender has a purpose to, to make food for whatever. But in that is a button here and a cell here and a computer chip here. And each has its individual purpose. So I'm that computer chip. So I have a little individual purpose in the overall working of this bigger purpose. So the big purpose we need to understand is, is to bring people, all ethnic groups, and I have a circle of influence, you have a circle of influence, to bring people, ethnic groups, into the kingdom of God. That, that's my big purpose. So that's the birthright of Abraham, which ultimately was passed on through Isaac and Jacob and Judah and Perez and all the way down to Jesus. Then we have to figure out what our individual purpose is in that. Let me, let me talk a little bit about how, how this, again, the, the bigger purpose. Yeah. Matthew 5, 16 says, uh, in the same way, let your light shine. So we're all individual lights. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. And, and my good works are defined by God, by the gifting, the skills, and the temperament and passions that I have. And we'll talk about that later on. So my per personal purpose is to let my light shine in my circle of influence. I don't have to shine in the world. You have a bigger influence than I have. I have a bigger influence than other people. It doesn't matter how big it is. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. Totally not but the issue. I do have a circle. It might be my neighborhood, certainly my family and my neighborhood, my church. Yep. And I, my purpose is to let my light shine and reflect God. And the picture that I like is, is the one of the moon. Actually, God introduced it in Psalms. I think it's 86. He says, we need to be like the moon. The moon is simply a big ball of dirt. It, it, it's pockmarked. It's ugly. But yet we look up at the moon. I think it was a full moon last night in Vancouver. I don't know if here or not, but you look at it. This is gorgeous. Wow, it's romantic. It's gorgeous. Well, why is it so gorgeous? Simply because the moon is in its right place and it reflects the glory of the sun. If the moon were out of place, then it would just be a lost in space as a big ball of dirt. But because it, Psalm says it's faithful to its place, it reflects that glory into a dark world. And we look at it and say, wow, that moon's awesome. It's only awesome because it's reflected glory. See, glory is simply a reflection. So, right, if we, if we, in, in, the, in, in the light of the sun, if the moon is right next door to the sun, you are not going to see the moon. No. Because you're seeing only the sun. Right. It's when the sun is down, that's when you really see. 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, people say to me, oh, I wish I worked in the church, all these nice people and Christian people, everybody's happy here all the time. I said, oh, no, 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 you're so lucky to be working in the world because the darker it is, the more you shine. The moon doesn't shine. In the, even though there's a moon up in the sky, we barely see it in the day. I know. But we see it at night. That's it. So that's God's intention that our, our, we as the moon, see, we're dirt too. It wasn't. Well, that is, so it, we're more like the moon than the sun. I oh, mean, definitely. Without question. Jesus is compared to that's, the sun. That's if right. There's an intrinsic light in Jesus. We have no intrinsic light. We are just dirt. And that's why God made us out of dirt. To remind us that we're just dirt. If, if, we're, if we're out of place, then we cannot fulfill our purpose. So finding our place is yes. central to fulfilling our purpose. So because being in our place allows us to reflect the one who is the light of this yeah, world. Yeah, we only, we only are a reflective light. That's, That's all we are. very good. Yeah, Thank it, you. It, it's very important. So when at the end, remember the, the parable of the five, two, one talent. When the, the guy with the five talents came back and produced five more, he says, you're good and you're faithful. Faithful. That's yeah. the key word. Right. And he, he said in uh, Corinthians, he says, it is required of a steward that he be faithful. So that's all I have. To, I don't have to be you. I don't have to be somebody else. I just have to be faithful to shining in my place. But I got to know what that is. Yep. And so I want to talk a little bit more about what, what that place is so that I can be a reflective glory. But just back to um, the, the, the moon. Again, it's dirt. We're dirt. Uh, the word human comes from the word humus, which is just rotten vegetation. So we are, we're just dirt. That's where dirt comes from, right? That's, it's true. But yeah. the problem is I forget that. And I think the world's about me. And God's my servant to help me live my life. And so I invite God, God, please help me live a successful life today. God, help me with this. God, help me. And God's my servant and it all surrounds me. That's backwards. See, I'm the servant of God to help him fulfill his purpose, his grand purpose. And so that's called humility. It comes from the same word. So when I'm humbled, I come back to the dirt again. I come to that place of realizing, you know, without God, I'm nothing. I'm just... That's what Paul said. I am the off sweeping of the floor. I'm just, the, the, I'm just nothing. But when I'm in the right place, then I become something because I'm reflecting the glory of God. Boy, Paul does make it. He makes a huge part of that in his letter to the Corinthians. I oh, mean, he does. I mean, that's where I, I was just going through that. And you're just helping put the, the kind of the picture together, the package. Because Paul is just simply saying, look, uh, Apollos or anybody, doesn't matter who they are. Exactly. Look, th that's not the issue. It's what are we, what are we reflecting? Who, who right. are we reflecting? And it comes back to the theme of Paul's life. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm weak. His grace is made sufficient in my weakness. So I'm content with persecutions. I'm content with distress. I'm content with shipwrecks. insults, I'm, shipwrecks, yeah, shipwrecks, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, you guys make fun of me. It's okay. It's okay because I'm just dirt. And when I realize that, then I can be in my place and then I can do the work God's called me to. But as soon as I get puffed up, then I'm in trouble. So, as soon as we get this image of who we, we are, we're in trouble. We're, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So, so let's go back to the beginning. Okay, okay. So good, good. We're, in, we're in Genesis and God has made Adam for a purpose, Adam and Eve for a purpose. He has a destiny for them. And their destiny is to rule and to reign with him. That, we're in partnership with God. But then in chapter 3, the, the devil, Nachash, comes along and he, de he deceives them. I see it as an angel of light coming in and deceiving Adam. And Adam made a decision there. I'll, I'll tell you a story. Do I have a couple oh, yeah, minutes to tell a story? Sure. Um, yeah, we got three minutes here before we take a break. <laughs> okay. This goes back to the early days of Foursquare. Our, the founder of Foursquare was Amy Semple McPherson, and she was a great dramatist. This, people would travel for miles to, to see her dramas in Angeles Temple in California. And she had packed 20,000 people in there on a, on a weekend. First big mega church. Anyway, when she died in 1944, her son Rolf took over, and big shoes to fill, his mom's shoes, and he, he didn't have the personality she had. So one night he's having this dramatic sermon, and he's going to illustrate the fall of man. And he, he had actually brought in palm trees on the stage and they had live animals from the, from the zoo and birds in the trees and everything, parrot in the tree, everything. And so he's telling the story and then the actors, Adam and Eve, are kind of acting this out on the side. So the idea was that when man fell, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, there would be behind the curtains, there'd be a guy who would smash a piece of glass and it would go crash over the microphone and it was the fall of man. Well, when, when that ha everything was going along just fine, the people were sitting in awe, listening, 5,300 people packed into Angelo's temple. And the, the glass goes smash. And the parrot that they had got from a pet store in the tree said, what the hell was that? And the pandemonium, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can say that on TV, but pandemonium broke out. I mean, he couldn't go any further. <laughs> 
But the parrot was right. <laughs> he was, the parrot was right. <laughs> Hell had broken, broken into, into our the world. world. It had. Exactly. And pride had replaced humility. And that was the beginning of self-centeredness. It got us off track. As long as we're self-centered, we're off track. So being God-centered is like the moon, coming back to reflecting the moon again. Yeah. Exactly. But, but the, the focus gets to be on us so easily. Yeah. So, and, and it keeps happening. I mean, I've been a Christian for over 50 years. But and it's still, I still follow I still the same traps. I still struggle with this thing. I struggle with, I mean, the very things you're talking about. I mean, in fact, I think within the church, we struggle with this in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Because we, we want to be successful. Yeah. And, and, and we become like Jacob was in his own strength, grabbing hold of the okay. heel. Because I'm going to pull myself up to be that success even within the church. For the first 60 years of Jacob's life, he's wrestling with this idea of trying to be somebody. He's working out with his wives, his kids, his father-in-law. He's wrestling, wrestling. He goes up and down, up until he finally gets it. He's wrestling with Jesus, actually, in I think it's Genesis 33. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's when he won't let Jesus go and Jesus changed his name to Israel, which means one who prevails with God, and he gets it. And, and for, you know, we could take a break here, but Israel's never the same after that. I mean, Jacob yeah. is, he's, he's a never the same man. after that. You never hear a struggle. There's never another, I mean, he's never fighting for anything after no. that. No, That's incredible. We'll take a break. I want to hear more about that. You, you got my, you really got my interest on this, Barry. Thank you. We'll take a break. We'll be right back with Barry Buzza. We're back with Barry Buzzard. Barry's written a book, and, and we're really chatting out of this book uh, today. It's Life Purpose, and uh, you may want to find more about that. Uh, actually, you're going to want the book. I want the book. Well, I've got the book. Here, okay. <laughs> got <it>. I've got <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, Barry, let's continue on here. I mean, the, the incredible thing about the whose world am I trying to build? Yeah. What, what am I working in? Yeah, we get up in the morning and we, we, we tend to say, Lord, I'm up now. Would you please bless my day? But that's not the way it works at all. It's, I, I'm stepping into God's day. May I bless your day, Lord. May I bless your day. May I fit into your plans for my day. And of course, a lot of us don't know what his plans are. But that, that's what we're talking about, how, how to fit into what God's plans are. But the problem, going back to Genesis 3 again, is that we fell, we flipped upside down, we fell off center. The, the picture I use is a wheel. I have in my office, uh, I use it all the time. It's from my daughter's little bike when she's a little girl. And I, I took the two wheels and I cut the axle out of one wheel. So I have all these spokes just kind of hanging there. And the other one has the spokes in the middle. And I said, this is how a bike wheel was intended. See, this bike wheel has a purpose. The purpose is to take the rider from point A to point B. But when the axle is missing, then the spokes have nothing to be connected to. It can't fulfill its purpose. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to put the axle in and the axle is God. So the axe, the center of our life has to be in place again. It has been displaced. We have to get the axle in. Then all the spokes of our life are our, our work, our, our leisure, our marriage, our family, our finances. All, all those things are the spokes that have to fit into God for the wheel to fulfill its purpose. So it has to begin there. I have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by inviting Jesus Christ into the center of my life. Reorientate, refocus my yep. life around yep. him. It ha has to start there. And then the wheel can begin to go somewhere. But before we're ready to go somewhere, I get into my next chapter and I deal with root problems because we have family dysfunctions. And so chapter five is about discussing and discovering the, the roots that are in my family. Every family has certain dysfunctions to it. It may be a tendency towards um, sexual perversion, maybe a tendency towards alcoholism, towards anger, towards anxiety. And we have to discover these roots and deal with them before the tree can produce what it's supposed to produce. So is there, there is no family that's excluded from this? No. Jesus' family, man, I, I, one of my favorite chapters to preach from is Matthew chapter 1. When we're reading through the Bible, most people just kind of skip over. So-and-so is the son of so-and-so and so-and-so. But I look down that list and I see hope. Because as, <laughs> I, as I'm looking there, I see a prostitute. I see a girl that was raped. I see a man that was a liar. I see murderers, all in Jesus' family. And, and some of them were not, were not Jews. They were Moabites or Edomites. And they, they, they fit into this family. So Jesus comes from probably the most dysfunctional family you can possibly imagine. And, and then comes out Jesus and hope for me. Because we can go back to any one of our fam families and we see these dysfunctions. <laughs> right. You don't have to go back too far for no, some of us. <laughs> no. <laughs> right to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I know. So understanding these roots. Now here, here's a scripture. Okay. Hebrews 12. Again with Jacob and Esau. Esau had a root problem. Jacob did too. Jacob's root problem was deceit. 
And all, th Abraham, de remember Abraham deceived and said, Sarah's my so, sister. It, so literally he got it legitimately. Through the family Through roots. the family true roots. Yeah. I mean, because Abraham passed this deception thing on. Yeah, Isaac did the same thing. And then yeah. Jacob did the same thing. And th they had to deal with this family weakness of deception. And then Esau had his own roots too. But here's, here's the one about Esau in Hebrews 12. It says, make every effort to live at peace, to pursue peace with all men and be holy. So that means to be whole. Live my life according Complete. to God's okay, plan. Yeah. Yeah. Together. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So we can actually miss the grace. The grace of God is the plan of God and the, the, the plan that God has for my life. I can miss it if I don't deal with the roots in my life. I'll give you an example. Susan and I have in our backyard a, a beautiful Japanese cherry tree. It just produces flowers, no cherries, but it's a just ornate tree. And about five years ago, uh, there, there came out of that tree a sucker. And I hardly even, I didn't notice it actually. Just, you know, that kind of a, a branch that sticks straight up. It has no fruit, no, no um, blossoms on well, it. Okay. So it's a sucker. But I didn't, I didn't think about it because it was just hidden among the trees. Well, the next year, that, that sucker was probably an uh, inch and a half thick. It just really grew fast. And I still didn't deal with it. Just let, it was hidden in the trees. The tree still had beautiful blossoms. But the next year it got bigger. I ignored it. I was busy in the summertime. Well, the fifth year came along last year. And that sucker had now become, I actually have, it's five inches across. It is huge. It stuck 30 feet up in the air. I was mesmerized by the fast growth of this thing. I found out from a friend of mine who, who works in the, the plant world that it's called a mazard root. It's a kind of a wild root. And what had happened was that sucker had gone up 10 feet higher than the rest of the tree and had sucked the life out of the tree. Now the tree was not producing blossoms anymore. So I took so it. So all the life was going into, into this, this crazy sucker, sucker thing. That wasn't producing any fruit at all. And she, so I talked to this girl who, who, who works with plants. She's got a doctorate in whatever it is, that she, plantology. And, and she said, that's called a mazard. And if you trace it back, you'll find a big root. And if, if, you, if you don't watch it, there'll be little roots springing up all over the place, these little suckers all over the place. And I looked 10 feet down the road, there's another little sucker coming up and another one. But the, the, the blossoms were gone. It had sucked the life out of it because I hadn't dealt with it. So with great delight, I took a chainsaw and I just snapped off that it was about 25 feet above the trees, about 30 feet altogether. I snapped it off. Huge. I have a piece in my office of this root. Right. When that happened, the next year, which was this year, I had blossoms again. But I had to deal ruthlessly with that root. If I don't deal with the root, then it's going to bother me the rest of my life. So we, we deal, we, we have our 12-step program called Higher Ground. It's another book that I wrote. It's a course I take people through dealing with the roots of the life. We, roots just aren't alcoholism. There's all kinds of you know, dysfunctions. Yeah, so, so addiction is one dysfunction. Yeah, but, but, we have all but, kinds but, of them. But you, it may be dishonesty. It may be lying. It may That's be, right. Some people are kleptomaniacs. They don't, I mean, they've got no reason to, but they just take things yeah. and, that don't belong to them. I mean, it's just life. And even we, we Christians learn to hide these things rather yes. than repair well, them. Well, we have acceptable ones and we have unacceptable ones. That's right. We have a list of, don't, if you're there, you're outside. Yeah. But if you're in this side, oh no, they, within the church, <laughs> these are very comfortable ones. We let you have these in our church. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Bad. I mean, but the thing is, we don't realize they're sucking the life out of us. Exactly. Even though I mean, we accept them, but they're not, they're not good for us. Yeah, they're destroying us. And they're taking us away from the grace yeah, of God and exactly. the purpose of God. My, my associate pastor Terry tells a story, he told a story a while ago about um, this girl that was um, said to her mom, mom, I'm going to a movie. And, and the way she was dressed, she's going to, you know, the bare belly and whatever it was, it was kind of a provocative dress. Mom says, you're going to go like that? And the girl says, yeah, yeah, this is the way they all dress. And, and she says, what are you going to watch in the movie? She says, I'm going to watch this movie. And, and mom says, well, how's that rated? She said, well, it's, it's got just a little bit of swearing, a little bit of sex, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a good movie. It's a good story, mom. And mom didn't know what to do. Her daughter, she was getting to the age where she couldn't really tell her what to do. So she said, well, honey, that, okay, that's fine. You do whatever you want to do. And when you get home, why don't you bring your friends home and I've, I, I'm going to make some brownies for you. And um, she comes home from the movie and got the brownies. And, and she said, I want to tell you my recipe. But uh, it, it, I put the chocolate in and flour and all this. And there's just a little bit of dog poop in. And uh, the daughter said, What? I'm not eating. She said, oh, it's just a little bit. It, it doesn't hurt. Just a little bit. It doesn't hurt anything. And the point was taken. Yes. The daughter understood that a little bit of whatever dysfunction is going to destroy the whole lot. And she didn't eat the brownies. So that's, that's kind of the roots in our life. And we have to learn to deal with that. Things are constantly blowing at us to get us off the track. That's very powerful. You know what? That's good. Because there isn't one of us 
that doesn't have something blowing at us. It's different things for yeah. us, but it's blowing our way. What are we going to do with it? Years ago, Susan and I were traveling down I-5 going down to Seattle, we were going to be speaking down there, and we were in a Volkswagen. I had lost my license. I was just young, and I lost my license a few times for speeding. And uh, good, Volkswagens are good to drive then. They didn't have much zip back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but I could zip them anyway. Oh, you, you did See, anyway. that was my okay. dysfunction. It was my speeding. Anyway, anyway, so I lost my license, and Susan was driving. We're coming up the I-5, and a wind caught us and literally lifted the car up. So she lost control. I tried to grab the wheel. I couldn't stop it. It was and we flipped over the edge. Of, the, the wind literally blew us off. The, we rolled over the cliff a couple of times, landed at the bottom. Uh, we, were both, we were both okay. But that, to me, it, I'm driving down the path of life, but if I haven't dealt with the issue, there's areas of vulnerability, the winds of life will come. And if we aren't ready for them, they can just literally blow us off the track. Off the road. So we have this path that God has preordained wow. for us. Wow. And constantly there's this enemy. And God has left him there for a purpose. He could have dealt with the devil, but he's left him there for a purpose to uh, actually cause us to grow strong. We grow strong through opposition. And so this opposition is blowing at us. So we have to know who we are, where we're going, deal with the roots before we can drive successfully down this path that God's called. It's a good picture. Thank you. That's a okay. very effective picture. So God has prepared it. So now the sovereignty of God, he, he has placed me into a family, yeah. the Buzza family. He's, he's placed, placed you into the Thiessen family. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I didn't choose that. I didn't choose to be a Canadian. I'm happy I am. I didn't choose to be a man, not a woman. I didn't right. choose to be my family, whatever. God places me in a family. And then he deals with me in that family. That's the context he deals with me. We talked about the girl that was uh, raped. Yeah, And yesterday, this, yeah. the baby that came from that. And she was uh, born through a rape, by a rape, and uh, in that family. But now she had to make something of that. And she did. This wonderful girl went to her father in prison and forgave him and all those things. It was an amazing story. So all of us have a family. Jesus had a family line, and we have to deal with what we've been handed. And God will use that. All things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So here's God's purpose for us. Now he's using the bad and the good blowing at us to actually drive us down the yep. pathway that he's called us to. Talk to a girl in our church, a girl whom I, a lady whom I respect very much. Her name is Elizabeth. I'll just make up that name. And um, Elizabeth, I, I found out, came from an extremely dysfunctional background. She had been abused sexually by her father for year after year after year. But yeah, she's such a, a bright light. She's a shining star. And I sat down with her one time over coffee when I was writing the book. And I said, Elizabeth, tell me, how, how, did, how did you come through this? Most girls that have been through what you've been through would, would hate themselves or have a lousy image of men or whatever. How did you come through as such a bright light? And she, she said this. She said, there is always a light in the darkest of families. And she was in the darkest of families. In the darkest of families, there's always a light shining somewhere. And That's I write good. about that. And I said, well, tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. She said, well, I was, I was being abused almost daily from the time I was just a tiny baby all the way up. And, but we were a Roman Catholic family living in Montreal and, uh, you know, extremely dysfunctional. My father was a gambler. He was a drinker. He was abusive, all those kinds of things, but still went to church Easter Christmas time. But the two lights were this. One is that one day when she was a teenager, she went into a Catholic church, just felt kind of compelled, needing mm -hmm. desperately God. And she, saw, she went up, she lit a candle and placed it in there and God spoke to her. She didn't really understand the speaking of God, but God spoke to her and he gave her a verse out of Joel that she had never read. And he says, I will take the, the years that have been eaten by the canker worm and the locust, I will restore those years to you. And God spoke to her. That's great. Then the second thing that happened is every January 1st, their father, a Roman Catholic, not by belief and lifestyle, but, 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 that's but what a he, Roman yeah, Catholic, sure. just because he lived in Montreal. And they, they had a habit, I don't know if all Roman Catholics in Montreal did this or not, but they had a habit of every New Year's Day, that father, as evil as he was, would take all of his children and pronounce a blessing on them. It was a rote blessing. But she said, when my dad placed his hand upon me, this time virtuously, and blessed me with the authority that he had been given by God, even though he was all that he was. All the rest of the stuff going on, but, all this, rest, but this was but right. God this, moved through this dad and said, that was the light in my life. And I knew that I was going to be okay. And she is okay. She's a, a marvelous minister I, to so many people. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That is so, so good. That to me gives hope that there's always yes. a light burning somewhere. So out of, out of this, this, this root thing, and I talk a lot more about it in the book, but here's five things to remember. Number one, God wants to bless every one of us. 
and whether you came from however dysfunction, God wants to bless you. He loves you and wants to bless you. Number two, he always has a light burning. It is never so dark that there's not a light burning. There is somewhere there is an answer. There somewhere is hope. There, there's an answer. There's yeah. hope somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And if we're looking for it, God will yeah. reveal it. Now, is that a, so when you seek, you will find. Okay. It's yes, God loves seeking. God loves seeking. And that's why he always tells stories, parables. He buries things a bit. He wants people that will seek him. That's a very important principle. Number three is we must choose the right path. I do have responsibility to choose. The path is there, but I have to make a choice. It's not just going to fall on me while I'm lying in bed. I have to choose the right path to take. Number four is parents hold a vital role. That Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that shall go. Now, so parents, if we are parents, then we have a vital role in helping our kids find that pathway. We can save them years of agony by helping them in the early years find that right path. If your parents did not help you, it's not too late because we still have freedom of choice, but it sure helps if parents have helped us along the way. And number five is the pivotal points. We talked about that earlier. These, these pivotal points and what I, what I did in my, my seven-year plan is I started to jot in the times that were pivotal. The time when I became a Christian, the time when I went to summer camp, the time when I got married, the times that changed the course of my life. For Jacob, it was, the, it was that time he was, he was going up to Haran. He was in a terrible state of mind. And he stopped, just coincidentally, laid on a rock and slept that night, just by chance, it says. And the angel came down and spoke to him, and the gate of heaven opened up. And he says, when he woke up, he says, wow. He says, I didn't even realize I was in the presence of God. And from that, then God revealed his destiny, his birthright to him at that point. And then when he wrestled with the angel, those are pivotal points. So God will use those to, sh to alter us. And it may be a crisis. It may be a death. It may be an accident. It may be getting fired or a divorce. God will use those to turn our lives around. So that's, that's that area. Wow. We could say more about dealing with the roots, but we've got, somewhere along the way, we've got to deal with these roots or they will drive us off the pathway. Now, now we get into discovering my identity. I, I love, I, we, we sit and read stories to our grandkids all the time. Yeah. And Disney stories are they, they always have a, a good moral to them. And one of my favorites is Snow White. So we've got this, this um, evil queen. And you know the story. And she's looking in the mirror. And she says, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror would always come back and say, oh, you are queen. Till one day the mirror came back and with poetry said that, no, you're not the fairest. Snow White is. And she became rage and mad. And she wanted to kill Snow White from that point on. But the problem with that queen is she didn't know who she was. She was the queen. She's the most powerful woman in the whole land. Snow White could be who she was, but I am right. the queen. Right. But her rage, because she wanted to be somebody else, she didn't know who she was. And so that whole story is based on identity, not knowing who we are. When we read it to the kids, we can tell about this knowing who you are and accepting who you are and the birthright that you have. That's extremely important. Well, that, that is powerful. So discovering my identity. Now, let, let's start in, in this discovery of my identity. Are we okay for time? We've got another couple of minutes here. Okay, let me just read a scripture minutes. and then okay. we'll, we'll pick it sure. up maybe tomorrow. First Peter chapter 4 talks about this identity. And it said, each one should use whatever gift he has received. We've all received a gift. Whatever gift you've received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. The multicolored grace of God is what it means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it divides the, the gifts, which we'll talk about tomorrow, into two categories. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. Upfront gifts, behind the scene gifts. So that's the first division. Some people are upfront people, some people are behind the scenes people. So it says, if you're a, an upfront person, he should do one speaking the very words of God. You and I are upfront people. We need to speak the words of God. If anyone serves from behind the scenes, he should do it in the strength that God gives. But in all things, may God be praised through Jesus. To him be the glory, the reflection, and the power forevermore. So that's the first verse that gives us this picture that I am a reflection of God's grace, some behind the scenes, some up front. Then, then we'll divide it up, and we'll take this tomorrow, we'll divide it up into the seven gifts that God gives as seven reflections of God's grace. That's incredible. And find out where we fit yeah, into that. Yeah, where we fit into that whole thing. Yeah. You know, that's really helpful. Um, begin to realize there's diversity. What, I mean, right as you're saying that you realize there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of, 
of, of, of differences, but that doesn't make one better than the other. And this no. is exactly the point. Well, he calls it the multicolored grace of God. I love it. And that. I take the seven colors of the rainbow. What is it? Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet, yeah. green, whatever it is. The, the seven colors are, each color is perfect. They're all reflection of white. God's white. Yeah. So we come out, you're red, I'm blue, someone else but is together violet. But together we form. Together we make the rainbow, we, the reflection we, of we God's light. The, the beautiful reflection That's of beautiful. God's light. Well, we'll take a little break and we'll be back shortly right after okay. this. We're chatting with Barry Buzza today, and uh, we're just actually in conclusion. The book is Life Purpose, and, and we're, we're covering material that's in this book, yes, Barry. Yep. Um, and, and you actually have a, a, a workbook that you, sa- that you have that you work through in a group. If yeah, we've done want that, to. And, and we also have tapes, too, that you can use. But uh, we can do it, you can do it in a small group. All the material's there. It, it, you take the workbook and you okay. kind of work through the... I love it for small groups, helping together discover your purpose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, like so far, like today, again, we're, we're looking at... You say that on tomorrow's program, we're going to be looking at uh, the multifaceted grace of God, the yeah. diversity we're, of the gifts. We're going to begin to unwrap our gifts so we have these Christmas gifts that God's given to okay. us. And we don't want to insult God by not unwrapping his gift. We want to unwrap the gift he's yeah. given to you and to me, different gifts. What, what, something that I, you know, that somebody helped, somebody helped me out, just made a comment on one of the programs not that long ago that has really impacted me. And, and, and uh, we were talking about uh, not, getting, not getting uptight about uh, getting other people's jobs. Like she, she talked about what our purpose was, our calling was. And she, she, the, 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 the statement she made that actually blew me away, Barry. She said that when Jesus was concluding his life, you know, like he had uh, John 17, when he talks about what he did there, he says, Father, I have done everything you asked me to do. Use that statement. And it just blew me away. And then he said, she says, do you realize that there were people that were still sick, demon possessed, all kinds of things. The Romans still ran, Israel, uh, ran Palestine. Yeah. And, and yet Jesus said he had done his job. She said, do you realize that he knew what his calling was, totally did it, was fulfilled in it. And he said, I've totally done what you've done. She says, too many of us see the big job and say, until it's all done, I haven't finished my job. And that's not the picture. Yeah, it's not about me. It's God's it's, job. It's, it's, I'm just, I'm doing my place. My, it's not all about me. Barry, you're so helpful in this that, that because we focus, it's not about us, it's about him. That's, and you talked about the beginning <laughs> of the program today, we talked about that hub of the wheel. Yeah. If the, if the spokes of our lives are tied into that hub yeah. and, we're, and it's, we're centered, yeah. our lives in that hub of Jesus Christ yeah. in God. And it's not even about that wheel. It's about the rider on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> the wheel is just part of the part of the bike. That's true. That's but true. But nevertheless, the center has to be there to fulfill the purpose to fulfill of the wheel. Purposes. Yeah, very so fun. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to having you on the next program. I am too. And we'll we'll chat more about those those uh, seven that gifting as you yes. talked about on the next show. Well, thanks for being with us today. We'll take a little break and be back with more of its new day right after this. I was reading in First Corinthians 12 the other day. Mm-hmm. Got started this because this is about the. Uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, hey, this is all about the Holy Spirit. I got into this, and something surprising for me, but it's, everybody else knows one of these things, how that happens. You know what it is? Everybody else knows something you don't think, well, how come I didn't see this before? Well, let's inspire one another. Okay, I want to Let's inspire encourage you. one okay, another. That's what we're that. here for. I will do that. Anyway, the Holy Spirit, it, what it talks about, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but all of them, every one of the gifts that, that, that are of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Exalt Jesus. Okay. Every one of them point to the work of Jesus. Point at the kind of thing Jesus does. And I, as I was going through this, I thought, you know, the Holy Spirit, his calling seems to be to, 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 to reveal Jesus, to expose who Jesus is, to talk about the works of Jesus, mm-hmm. to, to, to uh, give us revelation of the work of Jesus in our own lives. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, his Holy Spirit is all about helping us become more like Jesus. And the Father is all, I, I realize so much of the Bible focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the Father talks about my beloved Son who came to do my will, but it's the Father exalts the Son, the Holy Spirit kind of really refers to the Son, and, and I thought there is something so selfless about the Father and, and the way He loves us and everything else, and the Holy Spirit isn't drawing attention to Himself, He just really doesn't draw attention to Himself, He's always pointing at the other. And I thought, you know, I wish my, I mean, that's something that I want to have in my heart, where I would exalt the other rather than, you know, exalting me. God isn't about exalting Himself, He's exalting, it's about exalting the other part of the, of the Godhead. 
Okay. I just kind of really neat. I just thought that was really cute. I mean, uh, Jesus, you know, uh, you know, Jesus would would talk about the Holy Spirit. He says, you know what? No one can come up to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws. But the Holy Spirit draws us to come close. I mean, it's all about the other. It's, that's how I kind of saw this. I thought that was kind of neat. Mm-hmm. But it's the attributes and, the, and uh, yeah, the attributes of the Holy Spirit in His work. And to be able to recognize them, but then more importantly, be able to uh, participate with them. Well, that's you important. See, yeah, that's because that's important. the invitation. And, and my invitation, the re- very reason why I can even go to the Father, the very reason I can go to His throne room of grace is because of Jesus. And so I want to begin to participate with the moving of the Spirit and the invitation that the Spirit of God brings to me because He wants to see more and more of God's grace being lived out of my life and out of your life. You see, so He invites us to a banqueting table where there is a huge feast. There's an abundance. And that's what John 10.10 talks about is an abundance, the overflow. Isn't that what I want to see in my life? Isn't that what you want to see in your life is an abundance? An overflow of God. Yeah. And so I believe that as we participate with the moving of the Spirit in our lives, He's going to bring us, okay, through Jesus who is what? He is my advocate with the Father. He's the one that goes on my behalf that I might enter into a throne room of grace. No longer is there anything hindering or keeping me from my Father's presence. And in His presence, there is abundance. There's abundance for you. There's abundance Mm -hmm. for me. There is no lack in Him. So why should I look at my life and think I'm missing out on so much? And that's what got Adam in trouble. He began yeah, to think, man, I'm missing out on something here. Yeah, he felt he, see? Was, he was losing. He was, yeah, right. exactly. And that's what got him in trouble. Exactly. Right. But that is what the Spirit of God is there for, is to bring us through the gift of the cross, the supreme sacrifice into God's throne room of grace, that his life might be lived through you and me. I encourage you to get your copy of the book, Life Purpose. Uh, Barry, you know, shares so many stories and mm-hmm. his journey. And God has each of us on a journey. I mean, we talk about this so mm-hmm. often. But you know what? I feel it's important that we stay the course. It's true. You know, don't give up. Keep on going. You were talking about stories. And I was reading Robert, our little guy, a story the other day. And it was about a kingdom. Mommy, what's a kingdom? Well, in our day and age, it's kind of hard to start. Hmm. When if someone asks you, what is a kingdom? It's pretty hard. You know, where do you start? Yeah, where's the king? Yeah. And where's his domain? Right. And yet in the kingdom of God, there is a kingdom established in our hearts and in you know in this world, and I believe that it's mm. it's got a great well, future. I think the whole idea of what Bob brought about is a domain. Yes. And it's about seeing that domain belong to God here, this heart here. Anyway. Well, we want to thank you so very much for your financial support yes. of this ministry to Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Bye bye.